Hello, everybody. I'm Matt Stevens, and welcome to We Love Cycling. Now, I hope you're going to enjoy this conversation. It is with Cherry Pridham. She was the world's first direct sportif operating at world tour level. 2021, she worked for the Israel Startup Nation, and in 2022, she was with the Lotto Sudal team. We had a lovely conversation about what her job entails, and also we look back on a very successful Giro d'Italia. Hope you enjoy it. Shiri, great to uh, great to have you on um, on this uh, on this call. How the devil are you? I'm good. Uh, nice to be home. I'm, I've been home three days. Just got back from the tour of Switzerland. Uh, but no, uh, content, happy. I think we we should. We're doing this on a Zoom call, as everybody can see. And I think it's worth um, telling people, isn't it, that we, by a quirk of fate, nature, whatever, uh, we live in the same provincial town in England don't we we both live in Derby <laughs> yeah about, about a mile, mile and a half as the crow flies I think yes yeah, so we are literally yeah a mile, a mile and a half up the road and later on today we are going to go to a pub quiz um and uh, and ca- have a bit of a catch up but anyway that that's by the by so if anybody who is watching Derby is basically in the north of England and the Midlands isn't it really and it's we're not far from the Peak District it's beautiful isn't it no we, we'll call it the Peak District so eh? Yeah. Save it like that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Sherry, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, could you just, I mean, you're one of the, the DSs at, at, at Lotto Sudal. This is your first year with the team, but the second year at, at World Tour level. Can you just give people who aren't um, too clear about, about your background, how you got to this point now, and what, what your background is, where you've come from, etc.? Yeah, I mean, sure. Very briefly, I was a bike rider, um, I guess, at professional level, uh, but back in the day. Uh, retired from riding at the age of, I don't know, 32, something like that, and then went into um, running small amateur teams that went through to under 23 and then into Conti level. And that's what I've, where I've been uh, for the last 15 years until I decided that was enough uh, and then put my feelers out at, uh, at the World Tour level and then got my first opportunity with Israel Startup Nation. And then I've grown from there and then got the opportunity to work with Lotto Sudel this year uh, at Will Tour level, with the men, I might add. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's. I'm going I'm to lay it out there. It's a couple of years ago when you first were, were working at World Tour level after working domestically for, for a long, long time. Um, it was all about being the first women, woman World, World Tour DS. But I don't like to use that anymore. You're just a DS. And, and, and that's what it's changing that, that mentality, isn't it? Although it's very important that, you know, you're, you're a trailblazer. We need to remove that precursor, really. Is that, how you, is that how you'd rather it be? Yeah, it's really strange because I've never thought of myself as a woman sports director. And I yeah. clearly am. But yeah. <laughs> um, even when I started with a Conti scene with the men, um, I, I would go to say that I was probably the first woman that owned a Conti team. and was sports director at Conti level with with the men uh, and that sort of followed me all the way through my my career or my life as uh, as as it is um, this is all I've done and I, I'm hoping it's all I'm ever going to do so uh, I, but I've never thought of myself I've just I'm just one of the boys really uh, just doing what what my colleagues do day in and day out and, and I've known you for a long long time I mean we've both worked raced and managed teams together on, on the domestic scene for the best part of 20 odd years uh, and going back and I know that you do love cycling you're immensely um, passionate about it and you are I normally ask people where they are before we start but you're in your what is it your woman cave isn't it and it, I've it's been my, to it it's, it's, it's my woman's cave yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and you've got a lovely bike on the wall I've been in there it's very well appointed you, you could almost rent it out when when you're out on a grand tour you can rent <laughs> that out as a little uh, bit of alpine accommodation yeah it is uh, I'm very proud of it it's my little uh it's my it's where I come for some me time uh, I can put the music on and uh do do other things other than cycling um, if I need to well talk to I mean you've had a busy year so far this year uh, an exceptionally busy year um yeah. what's the season been like for you just give us a little bit of a sense of what your program has been Obviously, the highlight, I would imagine, would have been your first ever Grand Tour um, at the Giro. So, so what's it been like uh, this year for you? 
Well, it's just, uh, I, I won't say stepping up, but stepping up in the sense that working with an, such an iconic team as, uh, as, as Lotto Sedell and the various incarnations that Lotto have been involved with the sport, I think for 37 years. So uh, immensely proud to be a part of that history. Uh, but it started back in January with a training camp and, and it hasn't really stopped. I think this is the longest period I've been at home now. Uh, well, for, for the, between Swiss and my next race, which will be in Romania, uh, 10 days. So it's been full on from races that I've absolutely dreamt of being a part of. So even things like Paris-Nice, Catalonia, Basque Country, they're all new races to me. And I find them all, you know, equally all different. But I, this is my first year I did a Grand Tour. Um, so the Giro d'Italia, of course, um, just didn't know what to expect, but I had to take that little bit of an element out of, uh, I guess, being the first woman at a Grand Tour, um, being a sports director, not knowing what to expect, talking to my colleagues, telling me to pace myself. And, uh, but, but actually, after two days, I'm like, well, this is just like a normal, normal bike race, normal convoy. Yeah. You know, you can feel the, the higher expectations and, and whatever goes with the pressure of riding Grand Tour. But I um, loved it. Absolutely loved it. I mean, how did you maintain your energy? It's all right saying that it's just another race, but it's obviously a lot longer. There are rest days, but it's there's, there's a, a relentless rhythm to a Grand Tour, whether you do it as a DS obviously a rider even if you're part of the press everybody has their own set of experiences but generally speaking it is an incremental slow wearing down process physically and mentally but how did you cope did you were you relatively fresh all the way through or did you have your did it ebb and flow a little bit or were you pretty constant did you manage to manage quite a quite a nice level all the way through I think from from all the stories I was hearing, I, as I say, I didn't know what to expect, but I, I think I managed it quite well. And I, I probably had two days where I probably needed some extra caffeine gels and maybe a yeah. caffeine <laughs> shot of some description. Um, but, yeah, I mean, on the whole, uh, I think the rest days came, they were very welcome. Just uh, especially the first one, I think just that expectation of getting through the first week um, and going, OK, I'm here now and now we just do from day to day, you know, and then uh, of course we had the stage win as well with Thomas de Ghent. Um, and I was like, yeah, sometimes you have to pinch yourself, you know, is, yeah. this, is this really happening? Yeah, but that, at the that, end of the day, yeah. it's, 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 yeah, it's, it, it was part of that first, you know, that first experience, you know, but, but getting success at, at that level, um, especially with the starting out, with a lot of bad luck with Caleb. I mean, they had that awful crash. Some of the sprint didn't yeah. go quite right. And um, at that level, we know we know the level that sprinting's at now. It's that the margins are very, very narrow. We don't see quite as many riders winning as many races. It's just very, very busy at the top there. So a little bit of disappointment, I guess, which you had to make sure the riders were kept on an even keel. But then to get that success with, with Thomas must have been, um, like on so many levels, a, a relief. But it was magnificent, the way that... Um, the way that it played out, I, I was obviously commentating on it. I mean, it was, it was yeah. just for the neutral. It was just at pure entertainment. But obviously for you, you were in the team car that day, weren't you? Yeah. Now, you know, could, could I was, I was so, right behind him. Yeah, so, right so, behind so, him. And give, give us a little bit of a sense about the last week. We saw the way that, that the race um, ends up. You, you had a couple of riders in, in the front. I mean, talk us through the last 10Ks and the pressure that was on your was on your shoulders. I, and I have to say it was a full team effort from yeah. the you know from the communication that we had with the with team car one for those for those that are listening later team car one is directly behind the peloton and team car two which is the position that i was in uh for the giro most of the time uh goes with the breakaways so a lot of communication a lot of support between you know the staff on the side of the road but equally so with somebody as experienced as thomas again you know the information that he was giving me was key uh, and it was just a matter of, you know, managing uh, the situation on the road. 
um, which was getting really tense. I mean, even at, even at 30k to go, then 20k to go, then you work at 10k to go, and then think, oh my god, this is gonna, this is gonna, this is this is getting close. This could happen. Yeah. No, no, no. Just just fo- just focus, just focus. And then you have these thoughts. Oh my god, we're gonna win a, a, a grand tour stage. Oh no, yeah. Just focus, focus, focus. Then you've got Germe and and van der poel chasing behind and 3k to go it came down to seven seconds and ah, oh, it was just oh I, it yeah just the emotions matt it was just unbelievable um, yeah. something yeah. something i will never forget because it what it was you couldn't have scripted it I mean, for the note for you i would imagine you'd have liked to script it a little bit better because I, I bet your heart i mean you must you must have been nearly having like a max heart rate just in the, in the team car but it was. I did. I did yeah. look. I did look at the old Garmin and <laughs> afterwards, I was like, "Oh yeah, there's about you know ten minutes at about 190." So uh, okay, it, was, uh, it was. It was one of those days that, um, especially the last three kilometers. I don't know if you can remember, but there was that real tricky descent. And yep. Oh, well, you know, just keeping the focus, and then we actually. The team cars went down through to the towards a diversion, and the riders actually did the U-turn and came back, so we yeah. could look across and see. You know, uh, just just incredible. That, that, I mean, and how um, ultimately did you? I mean, did you? you there was, I think there was some bubbly in the in the, in the hotel the, that evening, wasn't there? Indeed, indeed, yeah, yeah, of course yeah, there yeah. was, of course. Yeah, and yeah, uh, no. just to, just tell me how that changes the um, the spirit in a team. I mean, it. A team without success, it doesn't mean that there's still a positive energy in the team. Um, um, yeah. Some teams are just driven like that. But when you do have success like that, it, it undoubtedly makes a massive difference to, across the board, doesn't it? Riders, staff, personnel, it, it really does galvanise a team and just changes the mindset to a degree, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. And as a sports director, it's it's so crucial to, to make sure, even if things aren't going well, you know, that you keep that morale and that sense of, uh, teamship you know that's where you're supporting everybody and just the, the, the nature of how we started with that grand tour um with Caleb crashing uh and then a bit later getting the you know not quite hitting the lead out right and then correcting that discussing that in the team meeting and then moving forward to that sp- sprint that he lost just by a photo finish you know yeah. just that that measure of elation to I guess a little, you know, sadness, disappointment for Caleb and the boys. And then so unexpectedly trying to go into the next stage with a new focus and look for another opportunity, but lifting the spirit the whole time. So it's it's just like this, you know, you're on your nerves the whole time, but managing the whole process is just part of part of what we do. And, and just from a, a tactical pl- a planning perspective, um, when, when Caleb had, had, had sadly departed from the race, how did you yeah. how did you look at each stage? Were there some stages you knew that you you weren't going to go for, and you, and you rested the riders, and then focused on treating some stages like a one day? What was the looking back on it? How did you strategize your race your race plan in terms of stages that were there were clear opportunities for you? Well, definitely, with the three sports directors that that were present at the Giro, I would sit down and 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 look at which stages the first week clearly with with Caleb and which yeah. opportunities were there for him. So those were 100% uh, with with Alan Davies, who's uh, Caleb's sports director. Yeah. So that is very sprint sprint focused, lead out focused. But when Caleb left, we had new opportunities and and you know almost a fresh start yeah. in terms of what our objectives were going to be so it was already you know the plan was to be offensive look for opportunities go in the breakaway you know so many times now we see uh, breakaways being successful you know almost almost more so now than you did 18 months ago so yeah. it's a way of adapting and and looking at the way the teams are racing and looking for opportunities to attack maybe where you'd think riders would never attack so attacks on descents or on moments where you just don't expect and that's it's the unexpected really that we have to adapt to and that's what we that's what we went out there and did as a team and that objective to put riders in the breakaway in in that Napoli stage just worked out we gave four guys you know the the opportunity to go out and look for a breakaway and we get three guys in the breakaway I mean you know it, it just how it worked out 20 riders and we've got three there 
you know, but it was a, it was a matter of using those numbers, the, the strength of a, the, the number there to, you know, to play the game right. And it's when you look at the way and you're quite right. I mean, um, over the last 18 months, two years, racing has changed in so many different ways. Um, and it's, it's becoming far more chaotic and difficult to predict. A lot of predictions on races in the past um, there's still patterns that we're familiar with, but they're gradually being eroded away, aren't we? And we're seeing a new, this new landscape of racing. I mean, are you, um, are you enjoying that? Because it's, are you enjoying that chaos and trying to think about what's going to happen and managing riders through that? Because it, to, I me do, as a, I do. to me as a commentator and Ned and the people and, and Dan and the people that I work with, it's brilliant because we, we can't predict either. And, and I think that's a good thing because there's this genuine suspense, isn't there in the air? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I've always been a sports director where I'm happy or open to taking risks, yeah. you know, within the tactic or the, within the strategy. Um, and I was able to do that a little bit at the Tour of Britain last year. Yeah. But the key there is to make sure that the riders are on the same page. So, you know, so you can talk about um, all sorts of eventualities and all sorts of scenarios till the cows come home. Yeah. But it's just having the riders aware of certain situations that if it does happen, we can react this way. But to talk about some maybe an, a, a crazy attack that nobody's expecting, you know, so and then trying to predict that other teams are also willing to take those risks, that we can predict that as well. And that's where the communication on the road comes becomes, you know, absolutely vital. Yeah, it's 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 been uh, amazing to to see over the last the last couple of years and also. We've, we've been used to maybe a little bit lazily saying, oh, it's pretty easy to get in the break. It's an early break that goes clear. There are one or two stages, which we know are going to be for the sprinters where we, we, we do get a soft break that goes. But yeah, apart from that, the ferocity of the racing is taking 40, 50, 60, 70 kilometers, an hour and a half of absolutely flat out racing. It's not easy to get in one of those, one of those key break days that looks nailed on for the break. Actually getting yeah, in yeah. the break You've got to have, a, you know, you've got to have a lot of race craft, but you've got, above all, you've got to have good legs as well, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's down to uh, which teams do you want to control. So you can yeah. get lucky, you know, yeah. and it can just roll off. Or you can have the hardest fight for an hour, hour and a half, and you can not be lucky and miss everything. Or you can end up like we did with three riders in the break. So it it's it really is down to the riders that are controlling. And that's where we're fortunate to have a rider like Thomas de Gent who can predict or even block or knows when to block or give the rider that's attacking some information of what's actually happening on that, on that front of the peloton, you know? Um, oh, oh switch the right. this, is, there. This, this is live. This is real life. This you, is live. So I've I, I just made sure I, I've just made sure I put my mind on silent. I knew I was going to get, I, I haven't had. Well, it's weird because, Every, everything was ringing. The phone is switched off. The <laughs> iPad's ringing and the desk is ringing. Because so, I haven't been in my office, I guess. Funnily enough, I've just had a call from Carlton Kirby. Um, there you go. <laughs> anyway, um, what... Okay, give us... A, first off, two quite big questions, actually. First and foremost, um, for people that are watching and um, obviously know that there's team managers, DSs, give us a sense Cherie, of, of what your role is within Lotto Sudal. You're, you're a director sportive. What does your job entail? Because I know it's a pretty meaty one, isn't it? That you cover a lot of aspects, don't you? Yeah. I mean, if anybody thinks that we just sit behind riders in the car, driving the team car and giving a bit of instruction, but no, it's, it's very complex um, to prepare for one race is exactly the same as preparing for or single day race is exactly the same as preparing for a stage race. So we, we already looking two, three weeks out at the logistics. Um, so looking at where the vehicles go. So we work with the, with the team in the office. Uh, we'll have sort of sheets where we can see which vehicles, which buses, which trucks, which vehicles are available for team cars, which Swannies. So there'd be a, a Swanee list. We can check with, who's who's available the mechanics then it's getting the bikes then it's adapting that to illnesses or covid or whatever the, you know the scenarios are then it's preparing the presentations then it's the vela viewer points then it's driving the car and doing the tactic and then doing it all over again so it's it's quite a complex job 
Um, it's certainly different to five, six years ago when we didn't have all the gadgets and trickery in the team cars, television in the team cars, if you like. Uh, so it's, it's busy. It's, um, it, it's hard work, but yeah. you have to, you have to love the job, you know, to, uh, to continue, especially when you're going from one race to the other to, to the next, you know? I mean, the, the, from a technical perspective, I mean, we know how, how, how the sport has moved on technologically with all the apps available and the, the myriad of data sets that are available. Now, to many that might, oh, this is great. This is just, but they have to be managed and, and analyzed yeah. and then utilized, don't they? And that is a big yeah. part of your role, isn't it? Is, is, is from, from a, uh, looking at the coaching side of it to, to, to a degree and then the weather forecast, the route, there's, there's so much um, data t- to take in and that I guess just makes your day just that little bit longer, doesn't it? It does, yeah. You know, just to, to, if you're doing a, a any stage, really, not just specifically a Grand Tour stage, but any race that you go to, it's all about the detail. Some riders like a lot of information. Um, each corner, how long the descents are, you know, how long the climb is, what, how, how long are you climbing for, but other riders like it differently. So you manage that, particularly in Team Car 2, if, you, if you're following the breakaway then it's a different scenario, but you have to be on it the whole time. And it's easy to make mistakes. Sometimes you can, especially when you're in a foreign country and the numbers are coming across in, in maybe Swiss and broken French or a bit yeah. of German and then picking up the race numbers and then double checking on cycling, you know, pro stats to check to see that you got the numbers right, double checking with team car one, checking to see the routes and, and you sort of managing a whole Concord's battleship, you know, in, yeah. in front and driving the team car as well. So yeah, um, yeah, it's not an easy job. So actually on, on that point, it's a really, really good point. Typically tell us the setup for you in a team car. Do you, do you always drive or do you a bit, do you a bit, do you do a little bit of both? So, so when you're in the I team do, car, I, we do both. So, you, you so, do share yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So DS1 will be DS1 one race, the next race, then we might swap. Um, but generally, DS1 will do the sport, sporting side, so the tactics, the the, the Bellevue points, the presentation, and then the other side, the other DS will do, do team car two, and back team car one up uh, with all the logistics. So that's doing the race reports in the evening, uh, the day plans, which we send out, uh, we, we prepare in the bus, send them out when the riders are off having their massages. Um, uh, so just backing up the logistical side. So that's what DS2 does. Sure, sure. So give us a typical day then on on, um, on the Giro d'Italia. From I, I know that your days are very, very long. Um, so you get up in the morning, What's a typical day look like for you, and what, how, and when do you ultimately get to bed, and, and what's in between? So, g- <laughs> give us a, a typical day, Sheree, if you can. I think I think the Jira is an exception, but generally yeah. the staff will meet two hours before. Um, so, if, if the riders are having breakfast, and for instance, we'll be up at eight, sometimes earlier, and uh, and and then the day starts from there. So it's it's breakfast, uh, making sure the riders okay, uh, then. Giro wise, usually long transfers. So we're in the bus hour, sometimes two hours, depending. Uh, immediately we pull up in the car park. It's preparing the pre- presentation, presenting the presentation, the strategy, the tactic, then getting them out on the bike and then doing the race. And then the riders will get out the bus at, at the hotel and the DSs will stay in, have a, have a bit of a debrief. And then we start planning the next day again. And then generally we will, at Jira, I don't think I ate much before 9.30, 10 p.m. at night, yeah. an hour for, for dinner. And then and then it was bedtime and do the whole thing again. And so generally 12, 13 hour days. Yeah. And what do you think is the part of the job that you enjoy the most? Because there's so many different elements of you as you've eloquently described, but what is the part of the job that gives you gives you the most? It's the whole 360, you know, just yeah. being working with the riders, working with what I've enjoyed particularly this year is the group that I've been more responsible for, and that's with the working alongside the climbing group. Okay. Uh, so they're all young riders, as as you may know, they 
somewhere between sort of 19 and 24, the group that I've been working with. Um, and, and, and that's been with at, at every single race. So you get to know the riders, you get to know how, what they like, how they like to be spoken to on the radio, maybe. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's the, that, that's the bit I do in working with the younger riders. And uh, what does the rest of the year look like for you? What, what's coming up? I know you've got a little bit of a break. You're not going to be heading to the nationals. So you've got a little bit of a weekend off, but what does the rest of the year look like for you? So my next race is Taurus Cebu in Romania. And then I've got a few one-day races, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, Tour of Poland. And I, I can't remember beyond that. But, yeah, it doesn't stop until, uh, I think, some of the one-day races in, in October. So I go all the way till, I think, the 18th of October. Right. Um, okay. And um, th- this is your your longest spell at home. I bet you've missed the dogs, haven't you? Because you, you, it's, yeah. it's a shame we, couldn't, shame we couldn't bring one in to show to show people. You, you, you've got uh, the... Four, it's four dogs, isn't it? Four. Yeah, yeah. In, if you if you've got a spectrum of dogs, big and small, you've got basically both both ends, haven't I you? Got the, they're, whole, they're... the whole range. Yeah, the whole, the whole. So yeah, Rocky's sixty-two kilo Rottweiler. Sasha's wow. a forty kilo long-haired German Shepherd, and then my my lockdown dogs, Winnie and uh, Bentley, two miniature Dachshunds. So they're mummy's babies, as as we say. And what's it like when you come back off a really long trip like the Jura when they they first see? I bet they go nuts, don't they? Well, especially when you open the door at two a.m. and they expect the the, the scream in the place down. So, but no, it's uh, I talk to them every day. Um, I talk to them on on FaceTime. So, yeah, it's uh, it's not it's the physical contact, obviously, but no, it's uh, it's nice. I do miss them. Good stuff. Well, Sheree, it's been a pleasure to talk to you You're looking really well glowing oh actually one thing we'd like to see there's a there's a pe- pe- peculiarity isn't there in cycle we've all, all all cyclists as we know have got strange yeah. suntans but show us your weird suntan it's called a, the we call it a ds suntan don't we and explain the reason why you have an unusual suntan <laughs> well of course when when we're driving we 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 drive on the other side of the road on the left with the steering wheel on the left so well i tend to get a I don't know if you can see that, but, and, yeah. but that's my that's my DS suntan. The other arm is not so bad, but yeah. That's um, right, yeah. You generally over a period of a year and, and then many, many years, you'd get one very, very tanned arm and one relatively pale arm. And it's quite it's quite strange. <laughs> but there yeah. you go. Thank you for showing us your DS's tan. Uh, and and <laughs> and, 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 sh- and sharing what it's uh, what it's like to be um in a, a big world tour team and, and what your job entails. It's been really enlightening, Shiri. And uh, and we'll catch up. Well, we'll be catching up later on today. Later on, yeah. See Take you in the care. Cheers. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.